Hello and welcome again. Uh, welcome to this edition of the brown bag. Uh, let's begin. I am sure some other people will join in, but uh, we have limited time of 55 minutes. So let's begin. And I want to welcome the speaker for today, Dr. Zainab Hizaji. She is the global lead for mental health at UNICEF based in New York. She has a doctorate in clinical psychology and has uh, 17 years of experience, uh, many of those years in UNICEF. And she, as her work will show, is leading the, the work on mental health for UNICEF on several fronts, on policy, on data, on advocacy, and coordination of the seven regions of the UNICEF. Uh, she also works very closely with other international organizations like WHO. And, and today we'll hear from her about what has been happening on the mental health under the leadership of UNICEF. Uh, I must say a disclaimer that uh, during these uh, seminars, webinars, the speakers speak for themselves and not for Harvard University. Also that this uh, webinar will be recorded and the recording as well as the PDF copy of the PowerPoint will be available to all the members. I see that there are 25 people already in the room. So with that, Zainab, over to you. Thank you so much, Shikhar, for that really uh, wonderful and kind introduction. Um, hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, I wanted to uh, kick off with a very quick story, uh, my own, as we talk about mental health, um, a field that is challenging um, as um, and is also quite rewarding. Um, so my journey started um, in Lebanon back in 2006, just after the war. Um, I was a fresh volunteer translator working with, at the time with an international um, NGO. And that's where I met uh, Dr. Lynn Jones. She was an incredible, uh, is an incredible child psychiatrist who was there to weave mental health support into the fabric of the emergency response. Uh, so she took me under her wing, believed in me, and honestly, that was it. She sketched a vision for my career that I had to follow. Um, and so driven by her inspiration and her support, I pivoted my study starting as a support officer in humanitarian work and chasing a degree in public mental health. Um, every class I took, every paper I wrote really paralleled a step forward in my career. Um, fast forward, here I am with a doctorate in clinical psychology, um, steering the ship for child and adolescent mental health strategy at UNICEF. Um, it's a whole of organization effort and every day I'm really humbled uh, to be at the table helping lead the way. Um, and really given the gravity of suffering in the world today, I'm equally humble to be able to share with you where we are as an organization um, and that journey towards securing child's rights to mental health and overall well-being. Uh, Jessica, if you can share the slide, that would be amazing. Okay, can you see? You should be all set. Great. Um, so first, I wanted to start with some key terms and definitions. You probably hear and see the acronym MHPSS used a lot at UNICEF in our internal and external facing communication that's specific to programs. MHPSS expands to mental health and psychosocial support. It's a composite term reflecting a continuum of support and care interventions in programming that aims to safeguard or promote psychosocial well-being and prevent or treat mental disorders. Um, it was originally coined by the Interagency Standing Committee Reference Group on Mental Health and Psychosocial Support for use in humanitarian settings, but this composite term is now widely used and accepted by UNICEF and partners and practitioners in development and humanitarian contexts to describe programming within the broader mental health space. It really serves to unite as broad a group as possible and underscores the need for diverse complementary mental health and psychosocial approaches.
And at UNICEF, our approach to mental health embraces a shift from thinking about mental health in biomedical terms, where the focus is on conditions to be diagnosed and medicated, where you are either mentally healthy or mentally ill. In itself, mental health is a positive state of being, and but it's not constant. Instead, mental health needs to be understood as a continuum at any stage of our lives, any one of us may find ourselves at different points on that continuum. And this extends from positive state of mental health and well-being to experiencing emotional distress of increasing intensity to displaying dysfunctional behaviors, risk behaviors, or addictive behaviors, and experiencing disorders that significantly impact daily routines. And while some persons will experience chronic and severe mental illness, most will move back and forth on this continuum. And the position on the continuum is really intimately related positively and negatively to the external environment. So the mental health of children and adolescents cannot be separated from the well-being and functioning of their immediate surroundings, their caregivers, their families, and their communities. But when we talk about MHPSS, it's crucial to understand its limitations and what it does not represent. MHPSS is not a band-aid for deep societal wounds. It doesn't replace the need for civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights. In other words, we can't expect mental health support to fix all the injustices in the world. It's not an alternative to ensuring everyone has their fundamental rights respected. But MHPSS is a critical accelerator, and it and it and it can it is critical, but it can't single-handedly undo the damage caused by big systemic issues like poverty and discrimination or structural violence. These are huge factors um, and that play into mental health and they need big picture changes to really tackle them. Now, a slight pause to reflect on fundamental questions that I'd like you all to think about as we resume the presentation. How do you define and understand mental health? Think about what mental health means to you personally. Is it just the absence of a mental disorder or is it something more? How does it show up in your daily life? And what factors do you think contribute in your, to your mental health? Um, second, how is mental health defined and understood in your cultural, social, economic, or political context? So consider the environment you've grown up in or currently live in. How do societal norms, economic conditions, and political climates shape the conversation around mental health? Is there stigma or is it openly discussed? Reflect on how these external factors influence not only personal understanding, but also public perception and policy around mental health. Now let's delve into the pressing issue of children's mental health. Our focus is, of course, as we move through these is not just on recognizing the challenges, but also seeking ways to address them. Now, as uh, now that we are in 2024, I'm asked about, uh, you know, really almost every day in my regular interaction, I'm asked about the state of children's mental health and I'm asked if it has improved. And my answer is not the most optimistic, but I try to highlight the importance of understanding mental health on a continuum because it really is uh, fluctuating and alternating as many patterns and systems emerge, um, as circumstances change and as support is provided. Factors that affect mental health also change over time, including economic and social and cultural patterns and also emergencies. And the world at the moment is really at a pivotal juncture, faced with a choice between greater global collaboration and increased fragmentation. Um, there are geopolitical shifts, of course, and the risk of conflict and economic fragmentation and structural inequities and climate and ecological crisis and the potential impacts of unchecked technologies that threaten children's well-being, their development, and their mental health and psychosocial well-being. But Avenues for global accountability and cooperation and positive forces, including those that are led by uh, children and young people themselves, they exist. And if they are leveraged effectively, they can protect and benefit children. And, you know, today, far too many children are burdened under the weight of unaddressed mental health issues. The latest available data estimates that one in four children live with a parent who has a mental health condition. And for us at UNICEF, this is a stark reminder of the importance of caregiver mental health and well being and the needs for interventions that seek to address these needs. More than one in seven adolescents aged 10 to 19 is living with a diagnosable mental disorder globally, and actually half of 
mental health conditions start by 14 years of age and three quarters by age 25. But most of these cases, while they are treatable, they go undetected and untreated. And with this staggering number of children living with mental health conditions, and many of these starting early in life, it's clear that early intervention is key and that in a conversation about global mental health, we cannot ignore this age group. And the state of the world's children in conflict zones and emergencies is also extremely challenging. And children in these settings face very unique mental health challenges. Today, children and young people are facing unparalleled levels of vulnerability. We have over 200 million children who are living in areas affected by armed conflict, um, while more than 30 million have been forcibly displaced. And in a conversation about child mental health, we have to talk about suicide. Globally, the loss of adolescent lives to suicide is staggering, with nearly 46,000 young people who lose their lives to suicide every year. And this equates to a devastating loss of a young life every 11 minutes, which really places suicide among the leading causes of death for this age group. These numbers underscore the urgency of our call to action on mental health, because it's not just about improving quality of life, it's about saving lives. And while we don't need another reason to convince us, here is another clear case for action. Um, this graph summarizes outcome from a cost analysis, which looked at the economic impact of childhood mental health problems as part of our State of the World's Children report um, on mental health and well-being. The study uh, sought to answer the question, what is the cost of inaction? And we found that the annual loss in human capital arising from mental health conditions in children 0 to 19 is $387.2 billion dollars. And what this means is that the economic implications of untreated mental health issues are significant, not just for individuals and their families, but for societies at large. And investing in mental health is not just a moral imperative, it's economically sensible. And with all this doom and gloom, it's quite shocking and devastating that nine out of 10 children don't get the help that they need. And why? Because resources to promote and protect mental health are devastatingly inadequate. The response from government is severely limited, who on average spend just 2% of health budgets on mental health, just 1% in low-income countries, only a fraction of which is diverted to children and families. And outside of high-income countries, there are fewer than zero to one child and adolescent mental health prof professionals per 100,000 population. So this is a devastating reality for an area of work where where your resources are your people, and which furthers a reality where treatable conditions go undetected and untreated. This treatment gap, of course, can also be further explained through a deeper understanding of the many barriers that prevent young people from accessing care. Many children and adolescents face barriers in accessing services because of geographical or financial challenges, there is a shortage in child and adolescent mental health professionals. There are cultural and linguistic differences that often create barriers to effective communication and understanding of mental health needs. We see this a lot in uh, migration and refugee settings. And there are negative attitudes and misconceptions about mental health, with, which often prevent young people from seeking help and support. So challenges are, challenges are huge, response and resources are inadequate. What do we do and what are we doing? The global mental health community is a collection of UN agencies and governments and civil society organizations and nonprofits and universities and researchers and service user groups and, and persons with lived experience and young people and communities. They all play a role in helping to build effective and equitable systems of care, but how? The good news is we know what works, you know, when it comes to mental health programming for children and families, um, we need to be first bringing together different sectors as entry points for addressing mental health issues and reaching those children, adolescents and caregivers that are most in need. Mental health is not a health sector accountability alone. We need to integrate mental health services across sectors of health and education and social protection and justice and other points of contact with children and families within their communities. And we need to build the capacity of each workforce across these sectors. Second, we need to recognize that the window of, for intervention starts from before birth. We cannot 
just respond and react to mental health challenges, we need to start in early childhood. And there are important windows of, of opportunity through adolescence and adulthood. And third, we need to understand that children's well-being is linked to their environment as informed by a that social ecological framework. In other words, child development and well-being are embedded in a child's own context and experiences with risk and protective factors tied to relationships with their parents, their caregivers, their friends and the families, their supports in schools and communities, sociocultural influences, as well as broader political and economic factors. And scaling up mental health services requires an understanding of the following five pillars. First, effective programs begin with solid data and information. We need reliable, validated data collection tools for collecting and analyzing data that guide strategic planning and assess the impact of interventions. Second, we need robust child and adolescent mental health policies. And these are the foundation for sustainable mental health services. These policies must be backed by adequate funding without taking from other priority areas to translate into actionable programs that can reach every child in need. Third, community-based multi-sectoral services and interventions are at the heart of child and adolescent mental health programs. We need to draw on the wealth of research and evidence to ensure that interventions are both effective and contextually appropriate. Fourth, a dual approach to the workforce is key with specialized mental health services available at the community level, but these need to be complemented by a competent, non-specialized workforce spanning the different sectors. This ensures that all children have access to the support that they need. And fifth, incorporating the perspectives and contributions of young people and caregivers themselves and ensuring that programs are not only responsive, but are also empowering and meaningful. And of course, underpinning these pillars are cross-cutting themes like advocacy and innovation. Advocacy drives the push for greater awareness and policy change. Innovation ensures that mental health programs are not static. They are encouraging and uh, they help encourage adoption of new evidence-based important in, in approaches that can be adapted to changing needs in different contexts. So delving into pillars one and two on um, data gathering and policy influence. Let's, let's first agree on why. Why is this important? Data on mental health is crucial for informing policy actions. These are necessary for major initiatives, um, such as last year, the successful adoption of the MHPSS resolution at the UN General Assembly in New York. They, the, the data was critical in formulating this resolution that now helps establish a consensus among member states and governments regarding their roles in promoting action on child and adolescent mental health and commits them to recognizing mental health as a human right. Data is also vital for informing high-level advocacy and driving commitments through forums that engage a multitude of stakeholders on multiple issues intersecting with mental health where mental health acts as a key accelerator and data is essential for programmatic and policy actions, ensuring that mental health policies and services are informed by data. And here over the past few years, you know, we have transitioned into this new era of data and evidence-based programming. Um, in 2023, we launched the Measuring Mental Health Among Adolescents and Young People at the Population Level. This is called the MMAP for short. Um, the MMAP was developed to close the data, to help close the data gap on adolescent and youth mental health ages 15 to 24. Um, so as you know, population level data on adolescent and young people's mental health is largely unavailable across countries. And this lack of data, it really hinders our efforts to address needs, um, which is why we have been leading efforts to develop this mental health module to collect clinically validated, culturally adaptable, freely available and comparable data on adolescent mental health. And the module has been developed by UNICEF and technical and multidisciplinary support from around the world. Um, it collects data on four core domains, um, symptoms of depression and anxiety, functional limitations, suicidal thoughts and behaviors, and care seeking for mental health and connectedness. And we're really proud that this uh, late last year, we were able to integrate this module into MIX. Um, MIX is our flagship household survey program. Since the mid 1990s, we have had 120 countries that have carried out one or more uh, multiple indicator cluster surveys, generating data on key indicators on the well being of children and women, and helping shape policies for the improvement of their lives. So, this integration 
um, into UNICEF's national level data collection efforts is really a crucial step towards improving our understanding of adolescent and young people's mental health needs. Um, I wanted to also highlight quickly the Countdown for Global Mental Health 2030 dashboard. The Countdown is a multi-stakeholder initiative and in partnership with Global Mental Health at Harvard. Of course, Shakar is deeply involved in this. Uh, WHO, the Global Mental Health Peer Network, and the United for Global Mental Health. It's resulted in an interactive dashboard that brings together information on key mental health indicators, such as mental health disease burden, mental health policies and plans, um, mental health resources, including financial and human, financial accessibility of mental health care, and self-reported well-being measures. Moving forward, it's important to ensure that field actors are aware of and sensitized on ways to best leverage this dash dashboard, because it's not just important that the data exists, it's important to think about how this data is becomes available and how it is utilized. And of course, a key pillar of UNICEF's strategy also encompasses our commitment to advance advocacy efforts to tackle stigma at each level, because yes, there's a lot of progress on national policies and laws, and there's a lot of progress on how we speak about mental health, but deep-rooted stigmas and discrimination continue. Um, I also wanted to highlight that as part of our work, we are addressing the ill treatment of children facing mental health crises. Sadly, um, you know, because of these deep-rooted stigmas and discrimination, uh, shackling and institutionalization remain widespread in some countries and communities. Uh, one of our contributor, contributors to our perspective series in our State of the World's Children Report is this young woman, Leah Labaki, who is now an activist for people with psychosocial disabilities. She was institutionalized at the age of 13. Um, she writes in her essay, there is no better way to promote mental health than to instill in the next generation the understanding that psychological distress is not deviant behavior to be repressed and hidden away, but just a normal aspect of human experience. Deinstitutionalization and commu community-based support will be key to achieving this. And these are the voices that drive our work. Um, I wanted to show this slide quickly because together with WHO and United for Global Mental Health and other partners, we are advancing on policy and advocacy by engaging in global moments that aim to influence governments in advancing on mental health. Um, looking ahead to 2024 and 2025, um, there, we are committed to elevating child and adolescent mental health on the global stage. Um, notably, um, there are a few important ones coming up like the Global Mental Health Summit that will be hosted by Qatar. But as you can see, this is a great opportunity um, to engage. Um, it's a great opportunity to uh, ensure that we are prioritizing mental health and discussions and outlining them in commitments. Um, I won't go through the events plan, but we will share the slide with you because many of these are live streamed and available for online viewing. And it's important for you to engage and learn and contribute thereafter through your learning within your respective fields and communities. Now, moving into MHPSS interventions and services, it's important for us to adopt a wider perspective on effective strategies for addressing mental health needs, understanding where and how the different interventions fit within the broader context is, is really important because mental health needs are, are not static, they're dynamic, and they're multifaceted. And the main message that um, effective, comprehensive systems for MHPSS is a dynamic network of interconnected services designed to address the full spectrum of mental health needs. Um, and so within this system, there we have promotive, preventive, and specialized services to form a cohesive continuum of care. So in this system, we have promotive interventions. These are universal strategies that are aimed at all children to cultivate a supportive environment that nurtures mental health and resilience from the ground up. Um, these include initiatives like fostering positive relationships within families and schools and communities by incorporating mental health literacy into education, education curriculums. Um, second, preventive interventions. These are targeted measures that are initiated after assessments have identified children who might be at risk. These interventions are proactive steps such as resilience enhancing programs or family strengthening strategies. 
We then have psychological interventions that are integrated into the system as targeted supports for children who are experiencing, experiencing symptoms of mental health conditions. These interventions are informed by evidence and are tailored to support children with a range of issues from mild to moderate severity. And at the most intensive end of the spectrum, specialized mental health services must be available and support children with severe and complex mental health issues. And of course, critical to the functionality of the system is the presence of strong referral pathways. And more good news is that we have really a suite of MHPSS interventions available for children. And these are designed to, the, to meet the needs of young people across different ages. These resources span the full spectrum from prevention and promotion to more focused psychological interventions. Um, I won't go through these as well because we don't have time, but there are really wonderful um, initiatives and interventions like caring for the caregivers that supports uh, caregiver mental health for children under five. We have um, art-based programs. We have um, Team Up which is a uh, and Play and Heal, which offer play-based activities for children under 12. We have I Support My Friends, which is a beautiful uh, intervention that is based on the principles of psychological first aid and, and, and fosters empathy and peer support. And we have psychological interventions that we have uh, published with WHO like Ease targeting children 10 to 14 and Bloom, a psychological intervention for children five to 10 years. Many interventions, we have them a few years ago, we were not able to say that we were able to cover all of these. Now we, we are, it is time to scale up these services. And of course, at the heart of these resources are our efforts towards um, improved family-centered approaches to mental health and psychosocial support. It is a more intentional focus on schools and communities to ensure that no child is isolated. Schools really can bolster mental health by providing empowering learning opportunities and a platform for critical mental health services. But they can also be a risk factor, places where children and young people are faced with violence and bullying and stress and abusive learning environments. And of course, we must continue to play a critical role in safeguarding mental health in humanitarian settings. And in expanding our initiatives for children, and as we take all of these interventions to scale, we need to recognize you know, that there we need to have this balance between breadth and depth. Scaling up involves broadening our reach, while scaling deep is about deepening the impact of our services to ensure there is impactful change in, children, in children's mental health out outcomes. And both dimensions go hand in hand. So we, as we increase our reach, we are equally committed to ensuring the quality of our services. Now, another quick set of reflections for you. What do we mean by quality in mental health services? Um, also think about how cultural, economic, and social factors might influence our definition of quality. How would you adapt mental health services to cater to diverse needs and backgrounds? Reflect on these questions and explore how context might shape the services provided to young individuals in different environments. Um, now, this lands us seamlessly on the importance of developing workforce capacity. We need to invest in a competent mental health workforce, both specialists and non-specialists, to improve access to services um, and address varying needs across our different sectors. And I wanted to briefly mention EQUIP, which is a collaboration between WHO and UNICEF. We heard today you know, from, from me on the, on the importance of increased availability of MHPSS interventions, but the types of training have not yet been stat standardized. So it's not been possible to tell the type or quality of training MHPSS providers are receiving. And so we're unable to assess the quality of care. Equip provides a set of standardized competencies needed for different MHPSS interventions, including those targeting children. And then most importantly, the evidence-based competency assessments tools to measure those competencies. Um, this is available online and we'll be sure to share the link with, um, with the organizer so you have this on hand. And in talking about workforce development, we cannot ignore the mental health and well-being of this workforce. I wanted to quickly provide a regional snapshot reflecting on the multitude of emergencies in the Middle East and North Africa region, um, you know, between COVID and the Beirut port explosion and the different earthquakes and the socioeconomic conditions. Um, there was a critical need to establish 
uh, uh, support for frontline workers, and that's where the Talk to Me Frontliner uh, Frontliner Wellbeing Preventive Preventative Care Package was developed to improve knowledge and attitude and practices of frontline workers to identify and address their own mental health and psychosocial well-being needs in their response and in their work. So concluding slides on workforce, reflect on how interdisciplinary approaches benefit the scaling of mental health services for children and adolescents, because we're not just talking about doctors and mental health professionals. We're talking about social workers and teachers and community health workers and others who are part of a workforce ecosystem that needs to work together with functional referral pathways in order to be effective and meet the varying and complex needs of children and families. And quickly delving into our final and fifth pillar, we need to acknowledge the strength of young people and employ the principle of nothing about us without us, which was coined by the disability and inclusion field. And we have aptly ap applied for everything that we do across uh, the humanitarian development space because we need to be advocating for uh, the inclusion of young people in decisions. This means promoting their participation and acknowledging the role of intergenerational leadership by incorporating the insights and experiences of young people, uh, only then can we really create more effective global solutions uh, with local rev relevance. Think about all the discussions that we're having today about climate change and the, and the climate crisis. We, there's so much that we can learn from young people. There's so much that we can learn from indigenous um, knowledge and leadership. And, and this wisdom is, is critical and, and has shown um, as really um, important in, in the way that they've contributed in areas like environmental um, conservation and health. Um, there's also in, in our research, um, we've established uh, incorporating diverse viewpoints, including those from young people, indigenous communities and female perspectives enrich our understanding. And so really this is, a, is critical to help um, avoid solutions that could inadvertently cause harm and in also at the same time ensure fairness so that even the most overlooked groups benefit from our policies and initiatives. And there are many resources and tools that support meaningful and youth engagement in programs and policies, and these should be employed in any effort. Um, I will also share these links to these resources um, with our organizers to, to share back with you. Now coming to a close, I wanted to present a case study quickly relevant to the ongoing crisis in the state of Palestine, a region that often uh, that's often in the headlines these days. Um, this case study is enlightening because it offers a profound understanding of MHPSS within the intricate fabric of emergencies. It, it illustrates the significant impact of these situations on mental health and underscores the crucial role organizations like UNICEF play in crafting responses to these crises. Um, so as we reflect on this approach to addressing mental health, um, we devised a tri-phase strategy that adapts to the evolving landscape of the region. Um, each phase of our approach is tailored to meet the immediate, intermediate, and long-term needs of the affected population. So in the immediate aftermath, phase one, which is the phase we are currently in, we phase a you know, labyrinth of challenges. The echoes of conflict disrupt the flow of life and the flow of our assistance. Access is more than a logistical hurdle. It's a lifeline that often that's often frayed by ongoing attacks and, and the constant shift of populations that are seeking refuge. Here, the mag magnitude of uh, needs, mental health needs specifically, it really does um, swell against the backdrop of instability and food insecurity. Our mandate is clear. We need to protect our workforce and we need to sustain um, hope and, and, and recovery through open lines of communication and advocacy. And in, the, in this phase, our primary, primary aim is to lay a foundation of support while addressing the most urgent needs. Um, so yes, preparation for subsequent phases is key, but our work goes beyond just planning. We're on the ground offering psychological first aid through our available services. We have hotlines that are um, really a critical pillar of our, of our um, response, offering crisis support to those who need and ensuring that no call for help goes un un unanswered. So from the mental health side, 
We are trying to integrate as much as possible through frontline water and sanitation, shelter, food distribution, and, and other forms of support that are able to access and, and be available on the ground. Transitioning to phase two, our shift focused towards stabilization. So as we strive to resume basic services, which are critical for mental health, our teams work tirelessly to ensure that food, hygiene, and shelter become stabilizing forces in the lives of, of those who are displaced. So we collaborate closely with affected populations. Uh, we're trying to integrate, we will try to integrate uh, service, uh, safe spaces, uh, refuge where children and families can access mental health uh, and psychosocial support tailored to their cultural and social needs. Um, and we will build on the existing infrastructure and the existing workforce um, within that community to help drive some of these interventions. And by the time we reach phase three, we um, our efforts will be directed towards healing and rebuilding with sustainability. Um, at, our, at the forefront, we will establish community-based models that focus on healing and integration of trauma support. Education and health sectors begin will begin to be um, to intertwine mental health into their core, ensuring that every learning space and every health facility is addressing the mental health and well-being of its community members. But what binds these phases together and propels our shared goals is relentless advocacy. Uh, we need ceasefire to, to, to support our demand for unrestricted humanitarian access and the reinforcement of mental health uh, interventions as life-saving necessities. And beyond the immediacy of response, we must advocate for long-term flexible funding that allows us to effectively transition to and implement uh, the phases that we outline. We've learned from multiple emergencies in the past that often we receive short-term funding for mental health services. We are seeing that now in Ukraine. We have done really important work, but we have uh, we but resources are now dwindling, and we're not receiving the long-term care that we need. So this is something that we need to get ahead of to ensure that we are receiving long-term support. Um, and finally, some key technical takeaways. And apologies, I know we're a bit over time. Um, we've just really, you know, I just really wanted to highlight some of the core things that we've, that I hope you've learned today from me. Um, maybe some of them new, maybe some of them reinforced, uh, but that really um, in order to support young people and their caregivers, um, our mental health interventions must meet them where they are. The, this means understanding their environment and integrating our services into the various facets of their lives for, for long-term impact and, and, and outcomes. We're also seeing a shift towards making decisions based on solid evidence and research. We've made significant strides, uh, but much more needs to be done. And we need to continue to build on the foundation of research and, and, and enhance our ability in scaling up services, especially based on the things that we already exist. And lastly, there we need support from political leaders and advocates, which is essential in driving forward commitments um, for mental health, um, which and, and making sure that it's a priority and ensuring um, that that the supports, especially during times where multiple global crises are occurring, is at the forefront of their minds and their resourcing. And some personal take takeaways, um, circling back to my opening, um, I wanted to end with maybe a personal message looking back over the years, um, you know, from Lebanon's post-war recovery to the corridors of global health forums. Um, I've definitely picked up a few truths. Um, hard work is a given, but it's the passion for the work that we do, the love for it. Um, that's what really moves mountains. Um, and it's the people who cross our paths, people like Shekhar and others who um, see something in us and give us that nudge that we need that truly shape our journey. Um, this is why I, I never turn down a chance to chat with students like you. I, I believe in mentoring um, and sharing my journey and in hopefully in opening doors for you, the up and coming generation of health practitioners, um, whether you're eyeing global mental health or any field that touches on mental health and wellness in all its forms, um, know this, that your path is yours to carve, but you are not walking alone. Um, thank you so much for having me, me today and I wish you all um, the best and um, ready for discussions and any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Zainab. This was uh, an extremely difficult task, but you did it very well to summarize uh, 
an enormous amount of work within within a short time so uh, we have 15 minutes left so i'm sure there will be many questions or comments and uh, i'll open up uh, very soon for discussion i am requesting jessica to uh, take away the slides from the screen and uh, we'll invite uh, anybody to to raise their hands and and do that i'll plant a first question for your consideration uh, before I give the floor to Wanking, who's already raised the hand, you referred in the introduction to some of the impact of technology, for example, uh, use of social media or gaming by young people. And uh, I would like to know, perhaps many others would like to know, what is UNICEF's position on that? Is it uh, harmful? Is it very harmful? Is it positive? And how does policy take account of these uh, very recent developments in doing that. So over to you, Zena, before I hand it over to the first uh, person with questions. Thanks so much, Shikhar. Um, it's, it's a really critical question, I think, that the whole world, um, as well as UNICEF, um, you know, we're trying to grapple with. Because when it comes to the effects of social media and gaming on mental health of young people, um, it's, I think it's important to start with the acknowledgement that technology's impact is not uniform. Um, it can vary greatly among individuals. I talked a lot about data and research um, in my presentation because our position needs to be, must be driven by the data and the research that has been done to kind of establish the relationship between mental health and, and, and social media. And the research is complex and not all studies are um, created equal. This means we need to uh, assess the research we use to inform our understanding of technology's role in young people's lives. And there are studies that point to a, um, you know, for example, a correlation between high screen time and mental health concerns like anxiety and depression. Um, the, the, these studies don't prove causation, they, they, they prove um, correlation. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics um, um, has produced some research that show that it's um, not so much about the amount of time, amount of screen time, but it's about the type of context and the context in which technology is used that is just as important as the amount of time that is spent on screens. Um, so there's also, um, you know, there's a lot that we need to know. And we do have, our Office of Research is developing a uh, research strategy to look at these impacts more concretely. Um, there's also a brighter side to the coin. Technology can be beneficial. You know, UNICEF is working in partnership with Spotify to create Mental Health Hub and the development of uh, mental health chatbot by adolescents in Nepal. Um, that one showcases how digital platforms can positively influence mental well-being. But to your point, um, Shikhar, uh, you know, about, you know, how do we, as we you know, um, differentiate the effects of various technologies and understand that not all social medias are, are you know, are, are have the same impact, we need to consider, um, you know, more systemic issues like cyberbullying and the underlying factors that contribute to mental health. Um, we need to be holding um, different levels um, uh, uh, and holding them accountable to the mental health and well-being of young people as they experience the online space. This includes equipping young people with skills um, to be able to navigate uh, online platforms safely. This includes equipping caregivers with the knowledge uh, and the skills that they need to help monitor and ensure that the, they, these young people are safe and their children are safe. And we need to also, um, you know, ensure that um, these social media platforms and governments are um, are, are demanding transparency from tech companies and a clear understanding of the role of algorithms in shaping youth behavior on these platforms. And this is for us, for UNICEF is non-negotiable. This is really clear in our policy efforts. And of course we need rigorous research. We need better research to be able to stay abreast of the evolving landscape of technology use. Thank you so much, Zainab. Uh, I hand it over to Wang King for the first question followed by Jackie and Vincenzo. Hi, thank you so much for the sharing I'm wanting. It's a really important um, field. And I have a question about the career trajectory um, as somebody like not trained in, um, not trained as doctor or nurse and hope to um, get into the field of global mental health. 
And uh, you mentioned you started as the translator. And I'm just wondering, um, do you have recommendations for people with like, um, like non-healthcare experiences and multi-language speakers? What are um, some feasible ways to get into this field? Thank you. And uh, Zainab, I would also request uh, with that question for you to uh, tell us about any opportunities for internship or jobs which might exist in UNICEF. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Shikhar, and thank you so much, Wanjing. That's a it's a it's a great question, and um, it's it's I'm happy it's a, and another point perhaps maybe to share more about my journey, but. Um, I, I definitely believe that we all start somewhere and we all start with um, an interest in the field. Uh, and that's where I started. You know, I, I mentioned I started as a translator, really just learning about um, what was what was happening within my community. And, and I think that would be always my advice is if you want to make a difference, if you want to engage in this space, start within your community, start where you know you can make a difference, start with the little things, whether it's translation or volunteering, what, what, whatever it may be. I know a lot of people who started as volunteers, who found passion, and depending on the, the road or the journey that they wanted to take, the career path that they sought for themselves, they started to build their education. And that's what I did. I built my education as I pursued a career in global mental health. There is a role for everyone to play, whether it's a translator or a volunteer or others, it really depends on the role that you seek for yourself. Um, and ultimately my advice always is um, start with the little things and start within your community and um, surround yourself by people who believe in you and also are, can can help you know mentor you over, uh, along the way. And oh, thank you. So, uh Yes, please. Yeah, do you see your language skills do making um like playing important role in your current work? Oh, absolutely. Yes. I mean, I'm I'm bilingual, so I um Lebanese American um and I think that played a really really important role in my uh trajectory because I was able to um you know, really speak the same language. Um I understood the culture within which we were providing mental health services. Um, and, and that also helped me grow, not just within Lebanon, where I started my work, but also use those language skills to also support my involvement and engagement in the surrounding and neighboring countries. So I slowly expanded my work to Syria and Jordan and, and, and Turkey and, and Libya. And so it was really wonderful to kind of expand my role from one country to the region and then to a global role. And so absolutely, it is very, uh, very a huge um, advantage to be able to use your language skills and knowledge of the culture to um, inject yourself into the space. Thank you so much. It's amazing, Dr. Hajazi. <laughs> Um, and to answer your question, Shikhar, as well on the opportunities, um, we do have uh, opportunities that come up from time to time um, to work on mental health at UNICEF. Um, this, of course, includes internships, uh, job opportunities, and consultancies. Uh, they can be found on um, the UNICEF Careers website. Um, and since UNICEF takes a multi-sectoral approach to mental health, you will find positions posted across health, but also education and child protection and other areas of work. Um, so it's not just a health uh, sector issue, as, as I said before, and, and that is uh, mirrored through the types of positions and, and internships that we open up within UNICEF. Uh, UNICEF does have a partnership with Harvard for its Harvard College Impact Fellows. Um, we have not had an intern yet or fellow through that program for mental health, but is it, it is our intention to do so. And we also hope to expand um, uh, expand its um, the partnership from specifically targeting undergraduate students at, at, at Harvard and hopefully um, expanding it to graduate students as well and doctoral students. Um, there is um, a link actually that I can share. Um, I will actually try to put that in the link now. It's our SharePoint site where we have the Harvard College Impact Fellows uh, information. And of course, maybe needless to say, for anybody who is interested in this space, there are a multitude of global courses that you can take. Some are free, some are a lot, a lot of webinars that are that are um, advertised that you can listen into. And there are of course paid uh, 
uh, courses and things like that, that you could also uh, sign up to. These are very short term. So even if you're not, um, your main area of studying is not mental health, there are other, there are opportunities to build your mental health knowledge through additional courses to support your ongoing work. Jackie? Jackie, you are muted. Sorry about that. Um, I just said um, thank you, Sheikha, for calling on me, and thank you, Zainab, for an excellent presentation. Maybe I could just, before I ask my question, just add to your uh, answer to the previous uh, question, which is we uh, I run something called the uh, Child Protection Program at Harvard, which is a a graduate level program and is a collaboration with UNICEF. So we have a graduate level child protection certificate program, which is interdisciplinary across university for all graduate students can apply. And then we also run some other training programs. So if there are students who are interested, they should, should um, you know, could, could find out. And we certainly cover some of these topics. Um, so I'm delighted that you, you raised this. My question is, um, given the interconnection of the problems you mentioned and given the multifaceted nature of many of the problems, um, to what extent do you think it's important and to what extent do you focus on really collaborating with other um, stakeholders in this space to highlight particular issues? So let me give you an example. I really love the fact that you started by saying this isn't a Band-Aid and I think it's a critical point because so often, you know, you see people spending money on mental and psychosocial health and there's, you know, no water and no, no school and no nothing. So that's a critical point. But it seems to me that there are lots of opportunities for highlighting particular cross-cutting goals, which we miss. So if you take, you know, you mentioned schools, if you take the question of violence, say just corporal punishment by teachers, which is pervasive across so many parts of the world, so many schools, and we know is correlated with anxiety, with school dropout, with depression. Um, to what extent are there effective collaborations, say between, you know, people working in education and people working in mental health, people working in child yeah. protection, people working in teacher training, et cetera, um, to highlight, say, you know, a theme per year or a theme per month. I wonder, you know, to what extent you, you work in that way. Just love to, to hear your thoughts and maybe any examples. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, um, Jacqueline. I think that's um, it's a, such a great question. It's one that I love to speak to, actually, um, because in my presentation as well, you know, I talked a little bit about mental health not being a health sector issue alone. And that is, I think, deepened by the, the ways in which we've come to understand the challenges that face young people, our understanding that we need to meet young people where they are. I mean, children spend most of their time in schools. And how can we, as an, as a, as an organization, not intentionally work with governments, including ministries of education, ministries of social affairs, to also ensure that there are policies that are protecting children within schools. Um, so that's one. So definitely working at the policy level, um, definitely working at the service level as well. You know, we are uh, trying to ensure that um, there are school, for example, when we talk about the intersection between education and health, there are school health programs that ensure that, um, you know, there are that nurses, that social workers within schools are equipped with the necessary skills and, and, and competencies to provide mental health support within those schools and establish clear referral pathways to the health sector and to social services. There's no one sector that can do it alone. We really need that kind of um, multi-sectoral approach to any intervention, whether it's an intervention that we're applying in health or within primary health care, for example. We do a lot of training for uh, general general practitioners and nurses within primary health care, for example, on how they manage, uh, identify and manage uh, minor to moderate mental health issues. But they cannot do it alone. They need to be able, who's going to be doing the day-to-day follow-up? Who's going to be following up with that child in school? With, even for programs within the health sector, they need to establish referral pathways with schools and social services and, and justice systems in, in some cases. So I think it's it's um, it's a valid point. Absolutely, we're working with stakeholders. We are developing policy briefs. There's a wonderful policy brief that came out last year 
through the Transforming Education Summit, where we develop this guidance for government on how they need to establish interministerial collaboration to drive the integration of mental health within education in schools. And it outlined the key interventions and priorities that are needed to do that. In, in, in addition to establishes the linkages with other sectors and, um, and areas of support. Uh, Zainab, we are going to be out of time very soon, but we have the last question by Vincenzo. So let's uh, take up the brief question and perhaps a brief answer. Uh, so thanks so much, uh, Zainab, for this important work. I'll, I'll try to be brief, although um, I, I wonder if this might need, need to be uh, answered somewhat offline. So just as uh, quickly by way of background, uh, I lead for the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative a course focused on national staff of national non-governmental organizations um, on humanitarian leadership, and it include, includes three components, psychological resilience, effective management, and adaptive leadership. Um, we'll be holding a summit to look at how the humanitarian community broadly is starting to look at climate change. And I'm wondering if you have any reflections on how mental health comes into play, both for the well-being of aid workers, but also how they engage and interact with affected communities as relates to climate. Mm. Um, that's, that's it's so beautiful. It's, it's such interesting work. I mean, I think we are now in a um, pivotal uh, moment within the mental health space and really looking at uh, very seriously and intentionally on mental health and how it intersects with other areas. We talked about technology. Climate is absolutely one that we are engaged deeply on as well. Um, I think there's, um, from the UNICEF side, we have um, the UNICEF Planetary Action Plan. So we do have very concretely, um, and this is a public, um, public resource, uh, what UNICEF is doing within this space. Um, and we are now working with our uh, climate uh, action team on establishing a joint mental health and climate action plan for 2024-2025. And it covers mul a multitude of issues. One is at the, po at the policy level. So making sure that in foras like um, COP, like COP28, of course, like uh, the one that just passed, we were uh, very intentional in ensuring that mental health was uh, central and integrated into the uh, climate and health declaration. That's something, of course, that is, is, is going to be supported as well as we move into the World Health Assembly. Um, so making sure that that is part of it and that the humanitarian piece is also included, because from a programmatic perspective, um, you know, there's a lot that we still need to know. There's a lot of research that needs to be done to better understand um, how we integrate mental health into climate work and how climate uh, considerations are integrated into mental health work. And there's a huge body called the Cli Connecting Climate Minds um, that is really seeking to do just that, establish what are those research priorities that can help advance uh, work on the ground. Um, there's also the Interagency Standing Committee on MHPSS and Humanitarian Settings, which has a working group on disaster risk reduction. And that's where I can say we are making very, very concrete steps in uh, integrating mental health into disaster risk reduction efforts um, through engaging governments and through um, our ongoing work on the ground with civil society organizations. And that is, I think there's important resources that have already been developed that can be used to support these humanitarian um, frontline workers um, in that in, the, in their pursuit and in your in your in your program. I know we're we you don't have perfect. much time, but that that was perfect. That's exactly what I wanted great, to know. Great. And, and, and I'm happy, to happy to follow up. And um, if you reach out to me, I'm happy to share all of those resources with you as well. Great, thank you so much. Sikhar, back to you. So it remains for me now to thank Zainab for such an outstanding session. Uh, nice presentation, nice discussion. And with your permission, if I could share the your email with the participants, and of course the PowerPoint in PDF form and the recording, that is great. So on behalf of the department and on behalf of all the participants, a big thank you to you. Thank you, Shakar. Um, humbled and really grateful to be with all of you today. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.